Good afternoon, dear audience. Uh, my name is Alexandra Jasim. I'm a family physician and trainer in professional diploma in general practice program. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, Professor Ayman Elbaz. Uh, he is a distinguished university scholar and chair of the bioengineering department at the University of Louisville, Kentucky. Dr. Elbaz earned his doctoral degree in electrical engineering from the University of Louisville. He was named fellow of multiple institutes for his out outstanding achievements in medical uh, imaging, artificial intelligence, and bioengineering. Uh, Dr. Elbaz is an author of 50 books, 200 papers published in prestigious high impact journals, and many more recognized publications. Um, Dr. Ayman will join us, join us uh, online. Um, let's welcome him, and uh, we are excited to hear his talk. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ayman Elbaz. I am a professor and the chair of bioengineering department at University of Louisville. Today, I will share with you our work in the area of artificial intelligence in medicine and its application for uh, chronic disease. Before I start, we have to describe how we can get the data. For sure, our major source or primary source will be the hospital. If this is project is still under clinical trial, we'll get it from research lab in the university. Uh, uh, for area of personalized medicine, it is better to use some uh, information or some mark environmental marker. That's why we use a pollution sensor in our work in addition to demographic data. So this is, will be the source or the input for any artificial intelligence in medicine. Uh, this is data. Imaging, with including all type, clinical data, genome data, digital pathology, and environmental. Also, this is how, how you can formulate a team to work in this area. Physician, usually they tell us what is the current challenge, what is the problem. Uh, which problem we need to solve. Then IT team to tell us how we can get this data from the physician in a fast way. Computational power included supercomputers to analyze this is a huge size of data. Scientists who help us to provide with solid hypothesis to help us to get a, a solid solution uh, which will help at the end to get FDA approval for it engineer who will work with the scientists to get good solution, commercialization. This is the team that will commercialize and the marketing our technology. For sure, it is very difficult to have all this team in one place. So usually we collaborate over cloud environment. So this is the current project in my lab right now. We have brain project include autism, dyslexia, Alzheimer, brain cancer, we have lung, we, uh, heart, we have heart failure and hypertension. We work in lung cancer and COVID-19. We work in prostate cancer and bladder cancer. We work in kidney stone, acute renal rejection, Wilmer's tumor and the kidney cancer. We are working in spinal cord injury. We work in neck cancer. We work in breast cancer and uh, what is the best management for breast cancer we for liver work in liver cancer and the liver transplant we work in retinal disease include md and dr and finally we start to work in dental projects today i will start to give you a summary of two or three projects that which, which uh, i consider we make a major achievement on them then i will talk in detail about autism for lung cancer, this was on my first project. It funded in my lab, and I am working on this project since 2001. And for lung cancer, this is how we start the problem. If the lung nodules is close to larger airways, it is very easy to reach them by biopsy. But if it is far away from larger airways, it is difficult to, to catch them. Then we, in 2001, we meet and say we need to develop a technology for early diagnosis of lung cancer. And this is technology must be non-invasive. And this is how commercialization team will come with statistics. 
Lung cancer is the first cause of mortality uh, in U.S., especially for male and female. And number one in, in the state of Kentucky, where I am live right now. And at this time, NIH started to start a study, which you call it Akron and Delcab, and their hypothesis. If we detect the cancer, lung cancer early, can this is increase the survival rate? Based on this, we start to develop this technology. This technology based on two parts. The first part is to make analysis to the breast, uh, 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 to, to, to the breast, which you get in what is called the breasting marker. And this is mainly depend on measuring the carbon compound in the breast. In addition, we will make analysis to all radiomic analysis to the lung nodules that will get it from CT. We integrate both of them and we make diagnosis. The best thing about this technology, we can come with a conclusion from one visit and we can go to the next step. And this approach able to reach accuracy right now, 96%. 96 sensitivity is around 98, specificity around 94. Second step, if we say this is cancer and we move to the next step, and by the way, the best thing about this technology, if we say it is cancer, we can move to the next step to check by, by biopsy, but if it is, say it is benign, we will not, we'll not do biopsy. So this is technology will reduce the number of biopsy cases that we need. If it is confirmed that it is lung cancer, uh, we need to start the chemotherapy. And this is, was a big problem that our clinical collaborator discussed with us. We can start the chemotherapy, but we didn't know when we have to stop. And this is important question because the patient can die from the chemotherapy, not from lung cancer. Based on this, we started to get four dimension CT and we start to analyze, measure the strain and the ventilation of the lung tissue. And we give this report to the doctor after five, from four to five sessions. Then the doctor can determine at this is point we have to stop and we can start another type of therapy like radiotherapy. And this is the team. If you see, we have engineering, we have commercialization team, we have medical doctor, we have a chemical engineer who help, help us to develop the microchip for breast analysis. We have uh, transplant uh, or lung surgeon who help us to make the biopsy and they get uh, biopsy sample. Second project, and we started this is with when the COVID start. Uh, we have the CT and the X-ray for the people, and uh, we know the, the health insurance tell us the main problem right now. We don't know how to manage uh, how to manage. COVID-19 patient, is especially after they uh, get out of the hospital. Some of them, they heart, have a heart problem. Some of them have still a chest problem. Some of them still have a problem related to the is, is a, a old factory nerve. Based on this, we start to develop AI system that can classify the people in terms of cardiology, mild, moderate, severe in terms of chest, mild, moderate, severe, in terms of all vector nerve, mild, moderate, severe. And based on this, we, if it is mild, we ask them to, uh, you can uh, see your doctor after six months. If it is moderate after three months, if it is severe, we can recommend to visit the doctor if every one month. And this was, uh, we did it with Humana, with the whole, uh, uh, one of the biggest health insurance company in U.S. And as you see, the same, the team include, it is a multidisciplinary team, include everybody, included medical doctor, commercialization, radiologist, and a cardiologist. Spinal cord injury, and this is one of the best projects that I like it, and because I started to see its clinical uh, impact, and here, uh, I just need to share. This is the people has a spinal cord injury. We uh, have this is big project in Louisville. 
that we make surgery for them and we connect uh, a microprocessor or microcontroller with their spinal cord and this is microprocessor it will replace the brain it will send the signal uh, represent standing sit down and walking uh, my role in this project this is a huge team my role of this project is how to program this is micro device especially uh, the combination this is device has 21 terminal uh, the combination different from person to person this one thing second the signal level is different from person to person some people respond from 0 to 5 some people respond from 5 to 0 some people from negative 2 to 3 so the level of the signal is, is different so I am using here artificial intelligence to see what will be the best a combination of a signal uh, and uh, what is their level that will help this patient to make the major movement which is standing sit down and walking to convert the patient from completely dependent to be independent and this is how we collect the EG uh, image signal from their muscles and during the me is during the vi visit we show the response using AI in color if it is red this is mean it is a strong contraction and this is what we are looking for if it is blue this is mean it is no contraction if it is in middle it is weak contraction based on this the doctor as see strong cont contraction he recorded this combination and we started to make programming for this uh, patient we feel also with time that maybe after six months the patient to come to us to refine the programming because maybe the signal may need to be increased a little bit or decreased a little bit I add one more muscles so usually we use it for initial programming and refinement and this is a short movie describes the main idea of this project Dustin Shilcox is paralyzed from the chest down okay try to move your other leg he can't move even a tiny bit. No. But doctors implanted this device sending electrical stimulation to his spine. And when Dustin turns it on... Whoa. There you go. Yes. Oh my gosh. He can move on demand. Okay, right leg back. And then forward. That's amazing. Yeah. When the stimulator's turned off, Dustin can't even sit up because his torso muscles don't work. But turn it on, and Dustin can sit up without any support at all. The first time I turned it on, it was exciting and emotional for me at the same time. Um, emotional because I was told that I'd never be able to walk or move my legs again. Dustin is one of four patients in a new study published Tuesday. Despite their gains, none can walk on their own. The device works by activating one leg at a time. It's not the first time electrical stimulation has helped paralyzed patients, but experts say this technique may become an important tool in the toolbox. I think that what's incredibly exciting is that we've opened up a realm of possibilities of what we can do now with people who are paralyzed, and we've just scratched the surface. Elizabeth Cohen, CNN, New York. And the second step of this project is the people who has a spinal cord injury, we have they have muscle atrophy. So the second step we use MRI to detect if there is the progression of muscle atrophy and we share this report to the uh, physical therapist. And based on this, he can determine the uh, time of the course and if he need to increase the course or use different uh, step and this is very very important to step in this project because if we have a, a severe muscle atrophy what we did in the first step using this is microcontroller it will not work last step when this is idea is work we use the same idea but now for the bladder we use a microcontroller controller and we started right now this is in mice and we use this is to send the signal using a remote control to make the bladder charge, relax to charge. Then when he use the first step and stand and walk, go to the restroom, 
he can push this bottom he make contraction to the bladder and he make discharge and we work this right now in mice and with the uh, uh, Cleveland Clinic and so far we got very good result for this part and the next step will apply on human and again this is a team for this project and this is not the whole team this is part of the team that I am working on it this is uh, the last project I will share with you today in more detail and this is project has been commercialized by diagnostic company autism diagnostic company and the, right now they are working with FDA to get F FDA approval for it so this is one of the projects that I started on it in 2004 and at this time I didn't even know what is autism so I met with one of the pioneers in this area, his name is Manuel Casanova and he came to my lab and started to discuss with us what is autism and at this time he described autism as a problem in uh, communication and problem in for, uh, uh, forming a relationship with the other or friendship with the other at this time he started the commercialization team start to help us to give us some statistics they share with us five percent of the children in us uh, can develop autism and this is the latest statistics for male and by the way the autism is more in male than female in males are statistic right now one in out of 44 has in the, has autism in terms of uh, this is the current statistic in total one in, in total one in one uh, one out of 44 has autism but in male one out of 27 in female one out of 160 so this is the current cost in US. In 2006, US spent $40 billion in autism. In 2015, they spent $268 billion on autism. And this is the projection in 200, uh, 2025. They, will, they, they estimated cost on autism of $461 billion. In diagnosis, in 2012, out of 40, $35 billion is spent in diagnosis. And when we start to work with the medical doctor, they, this is the scenario that they are doing. The parent is, feels there is something, there is a problem in their child. Based on this, they will meet a physician. The physician start to schedule different meetings. After different meetings, they make some analysis. After they make analysis, they maybe ask for MRI and the EG. Based on this, is they start to get pre-diagnosis and this is they make final diagnosis this is can take around from two years to three years with the family that be attention to their kid maybe sometime cut four or five years if the, the family didn't pay attention to their behavior of uh, their kids also another problem our clinical collaborator mentioned to us autism is spectrum it started from delay speech until no communication at all ellipsy scissor and it is a big spectrum. At this time, we started to say, can we develop a new technology that can help for early diagnosis of autism and also help us to tell us where this is the subject or child in the, in the spectrum. In 2004, we started with Dr. Casanova and this is his, his chart. And we started to at this time, we start with post-mortem patient and we started to analyze the data under microscope and we start to see that the distribution of, of neurons in autistic different than control. And the, at this time, we come with a new definition for this construction, we call it mini column. And in this is paper that we publish in the brain, we mentioned that the mini column in autistic is thin compared with the number of control this one is second the number of neuron autistic are many compared with the control this is why they come with their the size of the brain of autistic subject is bigger than the size of the brain of control subject 
This is why we use big brain to, re, uh, to refer to the autistic subject or autistic brain. So based on this, we start to collect data, brain structure MRI, which will help us to get the volumetric measure and all uh, uh, radiomic that represent the brain cortex, brain uh, fMRI to describe the connectivity or the, fun the synchronization between different areas in the brain, and we go to the DTI to describe brain connectivity. Today, I will share with you our work in uh, structure MRI. So for brain and autism, again, we will use, this is a big study that is started by NIH. They go to the family who have uh, autism uh, history. They collect the data from them, and they make uh, accurate diagnosis to them after three years, and they didn't share this data with us. And we start to collect it, fMRI, DTI, structure MRI, in addition, they connect, collected genome data and also they share with us their family history. And based on this, we started to create this is artificial intelligence system that integrate structural MRI, gen, uh, DTI, functional MRI, and we correlate with the genome. And after this, we make accurate diagnosis. And the first grant I got it from NIH. Can this is was before we start? This is we work three years in volumetric measure, but we come with a conclusion: volumetric years, even the brain size of autistic, is bigger than the brain size of control. But it will difficult to use it as a diagnostic marker because we find that the volumetric measure is sensitive to the age. Sensitive to the sex, sensitive to the pre-processing. This is why we go to the morphological or shape feature that to describe which is less sensitive to the age, less sensitive to the sex, and less sensitive to the race. Based on this, we started to collect structure MRI data, and after this, we construct the brain. And after we construct the brain, This is process must be very accurate. My team in uh, 2013 participated in a challenge. Our, uh, our approach ranked number one. This is challenge was in Japan. And in terms of even, it is not the most accurate. It, this is so fast, which is around six seconds, which help us to use in clinical setting. Because if you develop a software to, use, to do this task in one hour or two hours or three hours, it will not help the clinical setting. Doing this, we get all the morphological or shape features that describe the brain cortex. We feed it, and based on this, we start to make diagnosis control and autistic. And this was the first grant I got from NIH, and they are happy about it. But after we applied that we need to develop this for the rest, they told us, Yes, this is good as a proof of concept that the imaging can be used for early diagnosis of autism but you have to make your approach make sense to the physician because the, now your approach is a, a black box. You see autistic under control without justification why. We have to make your approach, make it a, 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 what is called explainable to a neurologist and the physician. Based on this, we started to use brain atlas and the brain atlas we describe to the area and we know uh, the functionality of each area. This area is respo uh, uh, responsible for vision, for listening, for emotion, for memory. And we start to describe this area. If it is below, this area match no control. If it is red, it is match autistic. If it is yellow, it is borderline. Then we got the second grant and we share with NIH. They told us this promising result but your way of visualization is very difficult. This is not acceptable for the physician. Based on this, we start the three, third phase of the project to display this number in color, and we map this color in the brain cortex. If it is blue, it is fit control. If it is red or orange, it is close to autistic. If it is yellow, it is a borderline. Based on this, the doctor started to come understand 
and we show which abnormal neuro circuit if the and if this neuro circuit responsible for vision he has has a vision problem is re responsible for memory we tell him this is has a memory problem and the doctor start to correlate what is come from our artificial intelligence diagnostic system with what they see with the child and what we they hear from the the parent based on this we started to uh, uh, test our approach in different data collected from national database of autism research we call it indar the first one which have uh, 200 subject 135 autistics 65 control their age from 23 months to 210 months and we and is the accuracy of this approach is around 94 percent with sensitivity 95 percent and specificity 96 percent also uh, uh, the best thing about this system that we can generate a report or is to tell us where this is a subject in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, autism spectrum where it is in terms of memory in terms of this speech is speech in terms of cognition and we share this and we this is do this is i show today today three case report one for to a, a normal developed brain and one for moderate uh, autistic subject and one for severe and we share this with doctor and the best thing right now we can do this is for babies less than a year and do before they become verbal we can predict their behavior in memory and behavior in speech behavior and cognitive before <coughs> before uh, before uh, they become verbal and we catch this is a uh, problem in communication the best thing about this is our uh, dr barnes and dr cousin who work with us they hypothesis if we able to detect autism at early stage this is will help us to early intervention and the early intervention they prove it it can improve the iq from 40 to reach more a close to 70 and there is big difference between 40 and the 70 iq 40 completely dependent but if we close to 70 this is will be this is will be a new independent uh, subject in the society again this is a technology has been licensed by autism diagnostic company and the, so far we got very good result as i mentioned overall we test this approach is now in more than 20 sites in us collected from different areas and the, the total accuracy over more than 20 sites around 94 percent and right now now and this is some of our publication uh, in, uh, related to the autism if you need to know more about uh, my work finally again i am not the one who did all this work we, there is a huge team behind this work this is the actual people who did uh, this work and I will be so happy to answer your question and the same time as you see uh, I have multidisciplinary team from all over the world from different states in US from Europe from uh, Egypt from United Arab Emirates and if some if anyone like to collaborate with us please feel free to contact me and I will be so happy to answer your question thank you and